Thank you, Dr. Lee. That's our loop master, Dr. Lee Carlson, and it is time for finding our fit. So I don't know why I keep misplacing my fit. Perhaps, Suzanne, you can help me find my fit. Do you have a moment? Yeah. Hey, Ron, what fit did you did you lose this time? <laughs> I, was, I was just speaking for in the general class of humans. We've, missed, we've lost our fit. What do we do? Yeah, I know. That's a really great question. And uh, it takes us at least an hour every week to try to sort through that. And uh, I'm really excited about today's topic that we're going to we're going to find our fit, at least on one thing, Ron. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to Finding Our Fit. I'm Susanna Wupong Calvert. Um, as you know, uh, the purpose of Finding Our Fit is to find our place in this crazy and beautiful world. And in so doing, we'll enrich our world, we'll enrich ourselves, and create a brighter future for everyone and everything in the process. I'm also the founder and executive director of the Foundation for Family and Community Healing. The Foundation's mission is to help everyone also find our fit, but through relationship skill education. So I hope you'll come check us out after the show so um, you can continue to develop your, your skills Find us at healingedu.org. We do do this pro program, as I mentioned, to help us make sense of our crazy and beautiful world so that we can choose for it to feel more beautiful instead of crazy every day. Many of us might have a tendency to just focus on the crazy, forgetting that there is that other side to the coin where there is also beauty and opportunity and healing. In finding our fit, we focus on the flip side of our challenges, where we can learn and grow, become wiser and more resilient by adopting a healthier relationship with everybody and everything. Challenge and then beauty and learning go hand in hand. So why not choose to flip the coin or view the yin to the yang and enjoy the benefits of that beauty, growth, and wisdom. It's a practice we can choose every day. I should throw Maybe in. When I introduce this topic, yes. one of my challenges are my dogs wanting to play here at my feet. <laughs> um, I, I usually frame it as being, uh, the topic is being on one side of the coin or the other. But today's topic, I really couldn't place it. Ev, so congratulations, you flummoxed me with, with your beautiful topic. Um, it just didn't feel like it really fell into either category. It sort of transcends the coin in a way. Um, um, you know, and, and truth be told, like all the topics do that. Um, I, I just usually put a value judgment on it and um, in terms of where I think it ought to be or where it seems to be right now. The topic for today is humility. And where does where does that go? It goes on both sides of the coin. It sort of is the metal itself in a way. Um, and, um, you know, I'm sure that part of my confusion about it is that it's not really on my radar, radar that much. And it put me into this introspective mood. Is, is that because humility comes so naturally to me or is it because it's so alien to me that I hardly ever think about it? And I was starting to have this <laughs> existential discussion with myself that you probably do that all the time in your work, but with a lot more productivity than I, I do. You know, it just seemed like a chicken and an egg. Like, if I think I'm humble, um, does that mean I'm not humble? And it reminds me of a conversation I had with my best friend who's a clinical psychologist. I said, I said to her one day, what if I, I think I might be narcissistic? And it was the same kind of thing. Like, if I think I might be narcissistic, does that make me narcissistic or less likely to make me narcissistic? I just, you know, my, it just made my, my head spin. Um, and I know that that this paradox also came up in, um, uh, in school when I was studying positive psychology, the science of well-being, about, um, about this strengths instrument called the VIA. It stands for values in action. And those of you who tuned in last week know that I'm a strengths coach. And we talk about the VIA strengths and the Clifton Strengths Finder strengths from the Gallup organization. But specifically with the humility um, strength, this topic of well, you know, you might score high in humility, like it could be a top of your list, but there is this, this, this quandary, like if I think I'm humble, may, that actually maybe means I'm not humble. Um, but, but in any case, humility did 
it is one of the character strengths that was identified by the VIA and the positive psychology community. And um, which it, the VIA measures 24 strengths with humility is one of them. And I looked at the strength and from their webpage, they, I shortened this definition, but basically says, humility means accurately evaluating your accomplishments. Truly humble people think well of themselves and have a good sense of who they are, but they're also aware of their mistakes, gaps in knowledge and imperfections. Um, and I know that Ev talked about this when it came to talking um, with people about difficult subjects, like knowing your gaps in knowledge. Most importantly, they're content without being a center of attention or getting praised for their accomplishments. Well, I think being a radio show host is sort of the definition of being the center of attention. But um, anyway, uh, so I, I have a lot of confusions about this topic, but also just a huge respect for it um, based on previous conversations I've had with the eminent and wise um, and generous Dr. Everett Worthington, who is a, a fortunately for us a frequent flyer on the show and a friend. And he has so generously agreed to come back to finding our fit to help us talk about the heroism of humility, balancing self and other focus. So welcome back to Finding Our Fit, Ev, Everett Worthington. Yeah, it's great to be with you again, Susanna. I enjoyed it uh, last time when we talked about forgiveness, and I'm sure we'll have a good conversation tonight. As we always do when you're here. Um, so um, for those of you who, who would like a refresher or didn't see the previous couple shows we did, because we did one on uh, talking about difficult subjects over the holidays, which I thought was a perfect topic, in addition to forgiveness, uh, maybe you could just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. And I know you're, you're like the, if we looked up Wikipedia, there'd be Everett Worthington there under humility, but um, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself, Everett. Uh, well, I, uh, I worked at VCU for uh, 40 years in the Department of Psychology, and uh, I am a licensed clinical psychologist in Virginia. I'm married. Uh, Kirby and I have been married for over 51 years and have four okay. adult children. Yeah, thanks. I have four wonderful adult children that, uh, would you like to see some, uh, some pictures? You know, I, I actually have yeah. pictures, but, uh, so, uh, I guess, uh, that's kind of the main things. Uh, I study forgiveness, positive psychology, uh, various virtues in positive psychology, and also am a, a, a couple therapist, so uh, although I don't practice anymore, but um, I developed a method called Hope Focus Couple uh, Therapy, and uh, we still uh, write books about that and, and do studies about it, things like that. So, you know, the, the science keeps me off the streets and out of trouble. It <laughs> takes up time between pickleball matches and, uh, used to be tennis matches. Uh, so that's that's me kind of in a nutshell. Well, and congratulations on your recent pickleball accomplishment. Um, I don't think I could do that at, at my age and I think I'm a few decades younger than you, even though it'd be hard to tell um, by, by, by interacting with you and, and seeing you, Ev. And what you didn't mention is your um, Commonwealth Professor Emeritus and really a um, an em eminent scholar in, in your field on so many, so many topics. And so we're, we're honored to have you here. So, so Ev, before we um, talk about, you know, ha have you talk about, um, or maybe somewhere in there, if you'd rather get started on what is, what is humility and um, uh, why does it matter and what, what should listeners do about it? Um, can you address this question of like, how do you know if you're humble and, you know, build that in there? <laughs> so that yeah, I can get out of my quandary, my mental uh, quandary about this. You know, so we give people a, you know, a scale uh, on a scale of zero humility to 10, you know, how humble are you? So if you, if you say nine, the problem is, um, are you really nine at humility or are you really arrogant and think you're so humble 
so uh, this uh, really kind of paralyzed the the science of humility for about 10 years that that quandary right there of how do you measure humility but I, I think one of the things that changed um, the science of humility around is uh, I read a little book in 2008 on uh, called uh, Humility, the Quiet Virtue. And my idea was uh, if, if I say I'm humble, you don't know whether I'm being arrogant or correct. But what if everybody who knew me said that I was humble? Well, if, if you start to triangulate different people's ideas, then, uh, you know, maybe you can know that, uh, that you're humble. So that book, uh, uh, Humility, The Quiet Virtue, really was organized around my mother-in-law, who I think everybody who ever met her would say she is a humble person. And uh, she just was a real example example for me, and uh, and so I really organized the different chapters around her life, wow. especially as um, as she developed dementia in her later years. She died at about age ninety three, I think. But in the last five or six years, she had trouble recognizing her family members, so it was very difficult. And and I was just thinking a lot about, so as people lose their personality with Alzheimer's or dementia or, or uh, you know, various reasons, you know, what keeps us, you know, as a person? And my conclusion was that the way uh, her family drew around her in love, they became the crucible that really, kept her personality going even though inside her body and inside her mind it was it was uh, fading away with the dementia so uh you know I, I think that speaks to the the way the importance of relationships in our lives and and how those relationships can really be something that contains our personality that's more than just our own skin containing our personality. Mm, that's, that's beautiful. And, you know, I'm, I'm just almost speechless about how much admiration you have for your mother-in-law and um, how some of us feel especially challenged by those relationships. And uh, for yours, it was just such a blessing and an inspiration for your work. And um, boy, it just sounds like a lot of gratitude and good fortune all around uh, in that in, in your fam family, Ev. Thank you for sharing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Kirby is a chip off of the block, you know, my wife. Uh, so she, uh, you know, she's a wonderful person and I love her and uh, it just grows. So, uh, and, and I think a lot of that is a result of the family she grew up in and, uh, and the way that she embodied the, the family ethos. Well, it sounds like you both married extremely well. Um, well, I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, thank you for sharing that, Evan. I guess I feel less uh, bad about feeling stymied by this topic if, if the smart people like you spent 10 years trying to figure it out and, um, and your mother-in-law is such an inspiration for finding the, the, the way to, the way to think about it. So tell us more about, I, I read the definition from the VIA Institute website about humility. Um, but before I do, I, 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 I guess I ought to just give a station identification. We're WRWK 93.9 FM. This is finding our fit. I'm Susanna Wupong. Calvert here with Dr. Everett Worth Worthington, um, Commonwealth Professor Emeritus, discussing the heroism of humility, balancing self and other focus. So tell us um, your your idea of what hu humility is, Ev, sure. eminent scholar that you are. Yeah, I, I probably ought to say one other thing about how do you know if you're humble? Okay. Uh, generally, it turns out, you know, after we went through this angst uh, as a as science uh, for 10 years, trying to figure out our self reports valid, it turns out they're pretty good, you know? So if you think you're humble, you're probably pretty accurate. The 
the problem gets to be when there's a real reason to portray yourself as humble. So if uh, if you apply for a job and somebody says, well, we want people who you know, are humble and fit in with our team. And, you know, well, then, you know, well, I'm going to say that I'm humble, you know, because I want the job. Uh, but in general, if there's not really a motivation to betray yourself in a, in a way that you might look at yourself later and say, nah, that was, that was kind of me playing a role. Uh, we're pretty good at our self report. So, so, you know, you can take a quiz and, you know, figure out your humility score and it probably is pretty accurate. Uh, my idea of what humility is, um, really, I put forth in a book with Scott Allison, who is a professor at, uh, at well, just recently retired, actually, at University of Richmond, although he's too young to retire, I might say, but... Anyway, uh, so Scott and I wrote a book called he Heroic Humility, and um, I defined humility as having four necessary and sufficient conditions. So that sounds really technical, but really it just means you got to have all four of them. So uh, the first condition is an accurate awareness of your strengths and your weaknesses. So that was very much what the, the VIA definition was talking about, having an accurate uh, perception of, of strengths and weaknesses. And then secondly, though, I think something that the VIA definition did not mention is, I think it's important to have an attitude of teachability so that you are really wanting to find ways to correct the weaknesses and to, and to show uh, your strengths in a more positive uh, way. So those are both kind of internal characteristics of, of humility, but the third uh, and fourth characteristics are more interpersonal uh, aspects. So the third is to have a modest self-presentation. So if I come across as overbearing and arrogant, then obviously people are not going to believe that I'm uh, uh, humble at all, and I'm probably not. Uh, so the fourth then becomes really the place where psychologists tend to divide when they're defining humility. They pretty much would agree on, on the first three but the fourth um, characteristic, I think, is to have a uh, <clears throat> an other-oriented uh, viewpoint in which you try to lift others up and not put them down. And the reason that people disagree about that is because I think about half of the psychologists would say, no, instead of an other orientation, you need to have a quiet ego. So humility is about quietening your ego. To me, the other orientation does that, but it, it, it tells us kind of how a good way socially to do that is, is to be oriented to others, to bring out the best in them and, uh, and not... Uh, oriented to, to harm others or to put them down. So, so I think that that other orientation is the best uh, fourth uh, uh, necessary and sufficient condition. So let me just name those again. Accurate awareness of our strengths and weaknesses, a teachability attitude, modest self-betrayal, and an other orientation to lift others up and not put them down. That's uh, super interesting, Ev. So I have a question about the attitude of teachability because yeah. there's another concept, I guess it came out of positive psychology, I don't know where, how you would define it, but that of a growth mindset. So if, if you don't have a growth mindset, are you less likely to be humble? Well, a growth mindset you know, is, is a, a Dweck's um, idea about learning styles. And some people have a belief that 
their personality is fixed and other people have a belief that their personality is malleable and can be changed uh, with effort with the right conditions. So, so to me, this is kind of a little slightly different than humility, you know, um, because a person might, feel that they have a relatively fixed character and it might be, feel humble. Uh, and other people might feel like, well, you know, I'm always growing and I'm always changing and, and that's important and that's part of being humble. So I think either of those could justify uh, a person could still test as humble and be perceived by others as humble. Uh, regardless of which kind of mindset they had toward the malleability or the, the elasticity of their personality. Right. So, so it's, it's not necessarily a requirement, but maybe it's helpful. I think it's probably helpful because, okay. yeah, we do want to be able to. Be okay. And so, um, Having um, a quiet ego, like you were saying, um, um, so really having that orientation is just an expression of having a quiet ego, but maybe there's other ways to express a quiet ego than another orientation, right? I guess it seems like a modest self-presentation would fall into that category too. Well, modest self-presentation, I think, is clearly a, a, an interpersonal part of humility. Yeah. Um, you know, I could have a quiet ego <clears throat> by meditating, by, you know, uh, you know, doing deep breathing exercises. It doesn't have anything to do with interpersonal interaction. So oh, I see. that's why I like the kind of the balanced uh, side of things where we I've got two conditions that are <clears throat> internal and two conditions that are social. And, uh, okay. and I think that's a good balance. Okay. You, you also mentioned that you, in our earlier conversation that there are different types of humility. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, I think one basic way of dividing up uh, uh, humility is to look at um, kind of a disposition or a trait of humility, which is relatively unchanging over time and across situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... Uh, there's also states of humility where there are just times where I feel more humble than other times. So we can see that that would be useful. Suppose that I'm going into a really delicate negotiation at work. I don't want to go charging in there saying, I am the greatest. You need to see things my way. That's nah, probably not going to be that productive. So getting myself, if I can, in a, a more of a state of humility in which I want to lift the others up, I want to, you know, accurately uh, look at strengths and weaknesses and, and not in a, a kind of a self-biased way. So, so states of humility are important uh, and they're useful at, at times. But of course, we kind of look at the character uh, a trait of humility as being uh, something that maybe we want to strive toward to, to, to approximate a humble character, uh, perhaps a little more. So that's that's one way of looking at types of humility. But there there are a lot of other types of humility. I didn't know if you wanted to react to that or before I get into the other types. Um, so I think what you're saying is is that. There's the trait of humility, so it's sort of like our our baseline, our set point on any given any given day. But that we can also be more intentional about modifying it in a situational way to, to alter our state of humility. Is that yeah? I get that right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And and that we could maybe as we're thinking about growing and improving on our weaknesses, we can try to modify our humility trait to that baseline. Right. And, you know, if people value humility, not everybody does, but if 
Uh, and, and often because they misunderstand it, they think that being humble means being a doormat and, uh, you know, just opening yourself to people walking all over you. Scientists uh, who study humility just absolutely say that's not humility, that's something else. That's dormatitis or some other kind of fancy psychological term. But uh, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, th I think people often don't value humility because they don't understand it. But, you know, if you think about who you would like to interact with, uh, you know, and what you would like your partner to be like, uh, often people will say, yeah, I, I value humility. I, I think that's a good thing. That's a virtue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, so, so it's interesting that if people, it's kind of like the Affordable Care Act, you know, when people actually know what it is, they tend to value it. Um, so, um, what other, well, I want to hear about the types, but I also want to hear about what other misunderstandings are there that might, um, confuse us as to why we may not think this is, um, something valuable, but I, I guess, you know, it's also kind of, I know it when I see it. And, um, I think though naming, naming it and naming it accurately is, is important because it can help us like determine how we want to grow, even though, a uh, modest self-presentation, like maybe everybody, you know, most people think that's a good idea most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, so talk more about the, these misunderstandings and, or whether you want to go back to types right now. Yeah. I, I think another misunderstanding people sometimes have is they think of um, people who are humble must have low self-esteem, but people can value themselves and, and have, you know, decent self-esteem, the idea is that this is an accurate perception of yourself that considers both your strengths and your weaknesses and does so in a non-defensive way. So, it, you know, humility is not equated with low self-esteem. It's, it's also not just um, eliminating pride. You know, for years, I thought, eliminating pride is what humility is. And, and of course, humility involves eliminating pride. That's, there, there's a lot of other things that can go into it. I, I just have a picture of my son. Uh, he's the number two child out of four, but I have a picture of him holding his first baby and, and looking in the eyes of that baby. I'm sure oxycodone, I'm oxycodone, right? Uh, <laughs> oxytocin is being generated as they look into each other's eyes, but, but, uh, and, and so they're bonding together, but that is, is like humility that doesn't really involve much about pride. It involves accurately knowing, oh my gosh, how can I care for this first child? I have no experience and yet what an honor it is to hold this child and to know that I can contribute to it, it, this child growing and, and thriving. Um, so I think, you know, to equate humility with just not being prideful doesn't get at the positive aspects uh, of humility. I think both of those are necessary. Both of both of what are necessary, sorry. Both, both the elimination of the negative of the pride and the, the kind of the more positive realization that there's a lot of promise here that I can do in elevating others and being other oriented and lifting them up. And uh, so, so both the negative and the, uh, the po eliminating the negative and, you know, uh, accentuating the positive. Are necessary to make up humility. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I guess, I guess the, um, that same idea is true for the low self-esteem. So um, that, that you want to have an accurate self-esteem. Um, and um, I guess it might get confused or there might be a misunderstanding about it because people with low self-esteem may not boast or be prideful but that's just, 
the downside without having any of the upside. Right. Basically. Okay. And okay. people, you know, for a lot of different reasons, people could have damage to their self-esteem. They could be depressed. Low self-esteem often, <laughs> often goes along with depression. So, you know, humility is, you know, not just low self-esteem, certainly not too high self-esteem either. It's kind of like the three bears, you know, <laughs> just right. Yeah. 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 And when it's just right, you know, we, we realize that we have a mix of strengths and weaknesses or lesser strengths, as we like say in the strengths, strengths coaching world. And, um, and that what's, what makes us beautifully human. It's that flip side of the coin. Um, okay. We are WRWK 93.9 FM. This is Finding Our Fit. I'm Susanna Wupon Callert here with a scholar Everett Worthington talking about the heroism of humility, balancing self and other focus. So we talked about what is what is humility and uh, how do we know if we're humble. So thank you for clearing that up for me, so I can sleep tonight. Ev, um, can you spend a few minutes talking about like like why this matters, like why um, why study humility and or even my own observation that well. You know, there's the components of humility. We kind of know it when we see it. Like, why does it matter to sort of name it and define it as well? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I do want to eventually get back to the different types of humility because I think that can be very interesting. But okay. you know, why is it important? <laughs> I, I think, uh, for one thing, it... Um, personality has been really kind of studied and studied for years. And uh, one system of personality is called the big five uh, characteristics with five traits that people have. But a competing system is, is called the hexaco model. So hex is a uh, six. And the sixth personality trait is called honesty, humility. So that is considered one of the ways that personality can be parsed right in its basics. So one reason personal uh, or uh, uh, humility is important is it is a basic personality characteristic, but also humble people enjoy a lot of benefits uh, from humility. And the major benefits are relational and also mental health benefits. The, there are physical health benefits, but they tend to take a long time to show up. So the relational benefits, we um, believe we capture in uh, three or four hypotheses. Uh, so one of those we call the social bonds hypothesis. And that is there have been quite a number of studies, probably about 20 studies that all show that people form better relational bonds when they're humble than when they are not humble. And that's just comparing humble and not humble. That's not humble versus arrogant. So that is going to be a much bigger difference. So the social bonds hypothesis suggests we make bonds uh, easier. And then we have a, what's called a social oil hypothesis. And the social oil hypothesis is looked at about 15 studies that show that our relationships, once we have formed a bond, our relationships work more smoothly if people are humble. Uh, so you can understand how that would be because you're not grading at the other person. You're kind of flowing with them. And then uh, <clears throat> the other um, uh, social uh, uh, hypothesis is called the uh, social buffering hypothesis. And this is like inevitably when we're in relationships, we do rub people the wrong way in that relationship. And and humility tends to buffer the amount of, of upset that people get when they rub each other the wrong way. So, <clears throat> so there are a lot of social benefits to people for being humble and to their partners in relationships. The other 
uh, um, benefits that as a category, uh, being humble, uh, are mental health benefits. And so humble people have been uh, shown to develop less anxiety, less depression, uh, less uh, stress often. Uh, so these are, these are kind of mild mental health benefits. They're not whopping benefits uh, like, uh, you know, other characteristics that people have might have more pronounced, but these are definitely replicable benefits to mental health that happen again and again and again. So, so those plus some physical health benefits um, are the benefits of, of humility. And for some people, there are spiritual benefits to humility, uh, especially like in the Christian religion, humility is a, a largely desired uh, trait that people have. So if people are able to genuinely practice humility, then you know, they feel better about themselves spiritually and, uh, and they're perhaps able to connect with other people in their faith community better. So um, other religions all value humility. We uh, had uh, uh, five uh, different uh, representatives of the five major religions each look at humility within uh, his or her own faith community, and every one of them uh, brought forth scriptures and you know proofs that uh, that in their religion uh, the uh, that humility is a valued virtue. So all of the, the different major faiths value humility. Hmm. That, that itself sounds like a really interesting uh, concept and relationship. And um, um, gosh, I might have to Google that more after this or have you back on the show just to talk about humility and faith. Mm -hmm. But um, so just to summarize, um, so humility, the concept of humility matters. Um, understanding it matters because it's 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 a basic personality characteristic of us, and it also um, helps us in our relationships, our mental and physical health, and and with and spiritually as well. And relationally, uh, it's about helping us um, form healthy relationship bonds. It helps to maintain the bonds, and it helps to mitigate when we have conflict or other damage. So a lot of benefits of yeah it, it is it's uh, there's quite a literature on this so uh, you know we had a hard time writing a chapter on it because we only had one chapter on the benefits and there were a lot of things to <laughs> to put into that chapter so we had to be selective. Well, um, I, I guess you could write a whole book on on just the benefits. So you can put that on your list of things to do. <laughs> Many things to you, you already have a long list. But um, the mental benefits. So you mentioned that there's less anxiety, depression, and stress. And so I mean, it, it also makes me think back to um, that low self esteem and not having pride. And um, um, so if we're if we have low self-esteem and low pride, we, we might just have, again, that's just sort of the negative benefits of the negative aspects of humility. So I would guess that that anxiety depression would be even more accentuated if we're just focusing on the negative aspects of humility. Is that, is that the case or do you sense that that's the case? And, or does that even make sense for me to ask that question? <laughs> But try it again, and, and maybe maybe I can uh, come up with an answer here. Um, I don't know. I guess I, I guess I'm just sort of thinking about that low self esteem, low pride thing. That when we only focus on the negative kind of qualities of humility without the positives, then that seems like it would just accentuate. Um, you know, our, our, our anxiety and depression, whereas having a balanced um, uh, array of ways we are humble, then that's going to offset those. 
Yeah, I, I think it does. I, th I think, uh, you know, true humility, especially if I'm thinking about other people, you know, then I'm not focusing so much on my depression, my anxiety, my stressors, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I have things that distract me in a very pro-social positive way. Uh, and so that's, you know, having that humble perspective, I think is going to keep us out of some of the mental health um, traps that we get into. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great topic in and of itself. Um, so I want to make sure we have uh, plenty of time to talk about what people can do to be more humble. And um, so um, I'd like to, if it's okay with you, I'd like to switch gears a little because in Finding Our Fit, we always want to talk about what the practical things we can do because it's not just like what we know, but what we do with that knowledge. So, um, and I know you always have like these steps and advice for us, Ev. So, so tell, tell us more what we can do to be more humble and to enjoy these benefits in our lives. Sure. Uh, I do want to spend about two minutes talking about the different types of humility. Oh, yeah. Okay. I never really got into those, but one of those we call relational humility. And, and that it basically boils down to if I'm in different types of relationships, humility will show up differently. So... A, a, a boss versus a worker is going to display their humility differently. Uh, so, so that's relational humility. But there's also uh, what a lot of attention is paid to these days is called intellectual humility. So intellectual humility is, is to be humble about the ideas that I have. And you can see right away, there's going to be two major uh, topics that just people aren't necessarily humble about. One of those is politics and one of those is religion. And so uh, there are others too, you know, other commitments that we have intellectually, but certainly one type of intellectual humility is political humility. I know that sound maybe sounds like a uh, an oxymoron, but uh, uh, but you know political humility, I think, is being able to discuss hot political topics uh, in a way that values the other person that that you know that is uh, uh, exhibits what I call committed civility. So I'm going to discuss these issues civilly and, you know, and reasonably as, as I can with this person. And yet I still have convictions that I'm going to hold on to. Now, in the philosophy of science, you know, what we find out is that, that scientists have a core of beliefs that are, they're very convicted about. And then there are peripheral beliefs about their topic that they could care less about. Those could be changed very easily. And then there's these middle range beliefs that, you know, well, they can be challenged and with good arguments, they can be put aside. So with both political and religious humility, people, you know, have convictions that may be strong convictions about their political beliefs and about their religious beliefs. But someone who is politically humble can discuss those with respect uh, and civility with someone that they disagree about and not get into, you know, having to go to Facebook right afterwards and, and uh, you know, say what an idiot that person was. So, uh, so anyway, th those are types of, of humility. Um, one other type of humility uh, is uh, what we call spiritual humility. And this is humility in the face of whatever a person holds to be sacred. So humility in the face of God. And this is why the five religious, uh, you know, uh, major religious um, uh, 
orientations all value spiritual humility uh, and most of them value the, the, the intellectual humility and relational humility. So, okay, I've finally got my pressure off to be able to talk about types. And, you know, why don't we talk about uh, what people can do that might, uh, if they wish to improve the amount of humility that they are experiencing. So, so, so um, thanks for keeping us on track with uh, making sure we cover that, Ev. And before I, I give you free reign to talk about what we can do, let me just remind everybody that we're WRWK 93.9 FM. This is Finding Our Fit. I'm Susanna Wupong calvert here with Dr. Everett Worthington talking about the heroism of humility, balancing self and other focus. So Ev, enlighten us, please, about what we can do about this and garner the benefits of humility. Well, uh, of course, we have made up an intervention to help people with this. Of what course. a surprise, yes. And, uh, and of course, it has five steps, you know, which parallels it with my REACH, R-E-A-C-H, forgiveness model. And of course, because mm -hmm. we've done randomized controlled trials on the effectiveness of, of this uh, intervention, I have posted it on my website, so it is a free workbook for anybody who wants it, absolutely free, downloadable in Word. So uh, I'll just, uh, you know, put that out. My website is www.evworthington-forgiveness.com. And you can find that under the DIY workbooks uh, link. So... Uh, I should say that we've done a number of studies, and one of the things that's interesting about this is people who fill out that workbook, uh, they end up not only becoming more humble, but also more forgiving and more patient and more self-controlled, even though we don't really mention those things in the workbook. So... Augustine said that humility was a master virtue. It is a virtue that is at the core of all kinds of virtues. And so it pulls these other virtues along as people ex experience a building humility. So, so what is this magic workbook? Uh, you know, well, it has five steps and we call it prove humility where Prove, P-R-O-V-E, is going to cue people's memory for the, uh, the steps. So the first uh, step is P, which is to uh, pick a time when you weren't humble and you kind of, you know, have reflect on that and, and then think about that and what went wrong in that. You know, how, how did you, what, what went south in, in that uh, interaction? And could you avoid uh, similar types of, of derailing of, of uh, relationships uh, in the future? So P, pick a, uh, <clears throat> uh, pick a time when you weren't humble and analyze that. R is to um, remember your achievements and your strengths. So, so we want people to remember this is not about being a doormat. It's about an accurate perception of our strengths, our achievements, our accomplishments, and the weight weaknesses and failures. So in this particular step, we try to get people to focus on the achievements and the and the things that they have genuinely built into their character that are positive uh, aspects of their character that they don't want to lose sight of. So then O is being open and adaptable to new experiences. So instead of I know my way of doing things and I'm going to be closed off to any new ideas, I have to 
have a reasonable openness to be able to consider new things I might want to do, new ideas that other people have, um, you know, and within my convictions, so that I don't betray my own convictions, be adaptable and being able to work in the, some of some new things into my life to to have a growth mindset like Carol Dweck uh, uh, mentions. V is value other people. Uh, so uh, like I say, this I believe is really the key because the more that I focus on valuing other people while maintaining a, a positive sense of self, an accurate view of my own strengths and weaknesses. So I'm not just becoming uh, somebody's uh, puppet, uh, but I want to value other people. Usually we don't have as much trouble valuing ourselves as we have valuing others. So, so we want to con uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, concentrate on that. And then the last uh, is uh, E, which is to examine the limits of my strengths. In other words, now I'm going to get to the other side and look at those weaknesses I have and how can I be teachable uh, to correct those weaknesses. The last part of that workbook then is to try to build this more into a, a character uh, of, of humility rather than just go through the steps uh, uh, for an experience of humility. So, so it's different ways to try to use this prove model to apply it to different relationships that I'm uh, in and different types of experiences that I might have. So this is, this is our uh, little workbook. Uh, we have uh, done uh, a couple of randomized controlled trials on that. Uh, right now, we've just finished up a trial on political humility up in the Chicago area uh, with two different uh, schools, one a religious school and one a, a, a secular community college. Uh, so uh, we haven't even analyzed the results on that yet, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing what we find about political humility in college students. Fantastic, Ev. So, um, but you said that just simply people going through the workbook, you saw all these improvements um, about being more humble, forgiving, patient, and self-controlled. But, and then I imagine that the effect is even greater if they build it into their character over time. Like how big of a difference is that, Ev? Well, you know, according to stats, uh, this is a significant difference, which tells you absolutely nothing. But uh, it's a it's a a recognizable difference. So you know, uh, we had about I think 160 people that went through the first study, and you know, significance is going to be uh, a, a fairly good step up. So people could recognize that they are being more humble than when they started the book. Now, we help them because we give them a little self-report instrument at the very beginning, uh, just for their use. They don't have to tell us about what they uh, answered. And then at the end of the book, we give them the same self-report instrument and let them show themselves that they have indeed gained in humility of, through working through that book, which takes a a fair amount of time. It takes about seven hours to work through. So it is a, it's an investment of time, but it pays off in terms of uh, a, an actual change in people's personality. That is maintained over uh, at least three weeks after they finish the workbook. Okay. That's, that's great. Um, and, and then, and then, but you said that the workbook also says how you can continue to uh, apply it and into your character. Um, like, um, and, and then I was just wondering like how, how much more impactful is, is, is it if you continue to attend to it over time? Um, it would be even more significant as they're like, I mean, I would imagine it's proportional to the effort you put in. Is that, 
I would I would guess that that is a big part of it. You know, how much yeah. effort, how many how many different um, kind of people and relationships do you try to think of? Okay, well, I would like to be more humble in this relationship, in this relationship, uh, and you know, uh, I'm dealing with somebody that is not very humble. So, what can I do without? turning myself into a doormat, uh, you know, how can I uh, treat them with respect and in a humble way? So I think the more relationships, the more time that people spend, the more that is going to get into their character and become a, a part of them that they don't even have to think about. Yeah. And, and I think this is really valuable, Ev, that you bring up this process because I, I feel the other, um, the, the, the challenge with doing this type of work is that I think we've, I'm, I'm going to make a philosophical comment as an educator that, that we sometimes think that like, like we, we say knowledge is power and uh, that, that sometimes we think that just knowing something is going to change everything or change our behavior, change our lives. And sometimes that's true. Um, and sometimes it takes effort <laughs> and, and over seven hours, over weeks and months. And that, you know, like with a lot of things in our life, you know, it took us a long time to get us into this mess and it's going to take effort and work to get us out. And um, I think, you know, um, improving our, our, our well-being and creating these, developing these character strengths and virtues, um, they take effort and intention and they can have very lasting um, um, and long range positive impacts. Um, so thank you so much for your research. Um, we've got four minutes left and I want to make sure that we can give everybody, uh, remind everybody where to find your work. But in, in the last couple of minutes, I, um, I would just want to just say how great it is that you're doing this work on political humility as well. And we had, I, I've been working a lot with um, a net, networks of folks, the Listen First Network, but there's a lot of people um, building, it's bridge building, and I'm sure it's full of people who can bridge those conversations and, and, and discuss politics with humility um, and teach others to do so. So is this political humility also similar to ability to have a conversation, maybe not about politics, but any other heated subject with a, a loved one or a coworker um, is that the same kind of humility, Ev? It is. It's it's a form of intellectual humility. And so it's being able to discuss really emotionally loaded ideas that people disagree about. So, you know, things like uh, how do you care for an elder that has dementia? You know, I know, you know, families have been torn apart because maybe somebody is really committed to the idea that you you got to put them in a good place and somebody else says well that's abandoning your responsibility as a, a family member and that is something people are really emotionally committed to and you can have convictions about it but can you talk about it and can you arrive at some reason decision uh without um you know destroying the other person and uh, and destroying the relationship I, I have seen this for years in couples that are in conflict and, uh, you know, they have lots of different issues that they are very emotionally committed to. And so um, we don't teach them humility in, in uh, a couple counseling, but we're trying to promote discussions that, you know, show, that show more humility on each side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this just seems like such a critical life skill. And I, I just makes me wonder why we don't teach this in, in schools and colleges and workplaces more more often. So so thank you so much, Ev, for another enlightening hour and for your beautiful body of work, not just on theory, but on um, interventions and practical ways that we can actually make our lives better. And um, that's that's what we so badly want and are focusing on here at Finding Our Fit and the Foundation for Family and Community Healing. And we are working at bringing Ev's workbooks onto our platform so they can, um, you can of course always 
download his workbooks on his site, but you can also um, have them in what I hope will also be a beautiful interactive format that you might enjoy as well. And um, it's evworthington-forgiveness.com. Check out his wonderful work and his generous um, gift to the world with um, his wisdom and knowledge and hard work. And um, you can also find your fit through relationship skill education at healingedu.org. And I hope before the end of the year, we could um, brag that we've got uh, at least a couple of Ev's workbook up in a new format for everybody to enjoy. So any, um, um, so we're pretty much out of time. We have maybe one minute left. Ev, is there anything else you'd like to just highlight or, or share um, that I failed to mention? No, I, I think you've done an excellent job of capturing everything and summarizing it. I wish I had the script there that, uh, that you uh, summarized, and uh, it would have been a lot more efficient that way. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for doing that. Well, I'll send you the, the video link so right. <laughs> you could play it back. Um, so thank you again for joining us, Ev. It's always a delight to, to spend time with you and even more so to, to learn, learn at, your, at your wise feet. And thank you, Ron, for um, shepherding us through another hour of finding our fit. It's always fun. It's a constant journey. Oh, I forgot to ask listeners to call in. I was so excited uh, by talking to Ev. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> listeners, as well. <laughs> um, we, should write, we should write some workshops sometime. Yeah. I add a little flavor. Anyway, well, I'm going to switch it back to our loop now in progress. And it's going to be democracy now, top of the hour. Thanks for watching. We wouldn't be here without you. So wave goodbye. Bye. <laughs>